Are you just starting the journey of understanding your sensitivity? Then today's show is perfect to hold your hand as you start to embrace your sensitivity and move towards a deep sense of happiness. This is the personal story and journey of two women, two mums, two wives and two coaches, both who are highly sensitive. Welcome to Love Life, featuring your host, Jane Donovan. The sun shines bright as it moves across my face. I feel the light. So what happens when I get to chat with another sensitivity coach from the other side of the world? You get two perspectives of living and thriving in the world as a highly sensitive person. Today's show is packed with tools and tips to understand, manage and embrace your gift of sensitivity. And yes, it is a gift. Both of us promise you so. So today I am joined by the gorgeous Mia Polson. Are you highly sensitive or parenting a highly sensitive child? Perhaps you love someone who is highly sensitive. High sensitivity affects between 17 and 20% of the population and is equally found in both men and women as well as in every species on the planet. A highly sensitive person has a different nervous system to roughly the other 80% of the population. And until understood and managed, it can cause extreme emotional overwhelmment. It often has heightened awareness and arousal, a mind that just doesn't stop thinking, think the overthinker, which of course can often result in paranoia and insecurity. It can have people feeling deeply unworthy of love because of a sense of being flawed in their very being. And that results in shame, embarrassment and insecurity. And the biggie for many people, feelings that so often are deeply hurt by others, usually multiple times each day. It's exhaustive, debilitating and soul destroying if it's not understood and then managed well. So today's episode is the story of the journey from the heartbreaking realization of being highly sensitive to celebrating the gift that it really is. This is the story of two women on opposite sides of the planet, two mums, two business owners, two wives, two coaches, who both share what life was like realizing we were highly sensitive, how we made the changes needed, and ultimately created a life full of happiness, embracing the gifts of sensitivity. So I am now joined by the beautiful Mia, all the way from Germany. Can you share with me, gorgeous Mia, your highly sensitive story? Well, I had no clue. I didn't know anything about highly sensitive. It, basically, anything about um, how my nerve system could be could even affect my body or my mood or you know, that my senses could be more sensitive or anything like that before I, I became a mom. And we had our first child when I was 23 years old, so I was very young. But before I became a mom, I had like tons of resources, like always high on energy, very extroverted, always, uh, you know, a go-getter and like really um, what, what you from um, our society's perspective would call successful, very successful. With everything I touched, because I had a lot of energy to actually just do it. Um, but what I felt was often that I didn't have a connection to myself. But, you know, at that point, it just wasn't that important. Um, so when I became a mom, we had this amazing little creature. Um, and it was such a game changer for me. Um, we had a boy. I have never, I had never been around boys because I only had, had like cousins and, you know. Um, Would have been my, my, quite a shock, I imagine. Yeah, and sisters and, you know, so I was, I was like, oh, shit, how, how fuck do you deal with that? And, you know, in our culture again, especially, you know, I'm from Denmark and we have some certain things that this is what boys do. This is how boys are. You know, a little more active, a little more extroverted, uh, you know, so-called wild. So, like, more active, you know, playing war and all that good stuff. <laughs> well, so we got this highly sensitive 
totally introverted boy and we, we, we didn't know that. So we just kept on doing our things, you know, we, we were like, no, we're not going to change lives. Uh, and it resulted in him getting eczema all over his body when he was six months old. And I just didn't know, I just didn't know what to do about it. But at the same time, I think motherhood kind of opened my, my, um, my heart uh, in a way where I could feel um, that it just didn't feel right to just put him on, on a lot of medicine. I was like always certain there was something else to it. So this, this just kept on going for, you know, until he was three years old, actually. And um, and I just kept on exploring what, what is this about? Um, and suddenly we just met this very amazing, wise woman to help us help Luca uh, with his eczema. And he, she's a reflexologist, nutrition expert. And I, I told her, you know, I just have this feeling that this, this, is not, uh, this is not about just like some crazy eczema. This is about something else. And she was just like, yeah, I think you're right. If you feel that way, I'm, I'm sure you're right. And then she said to me, you know, let's, let's put him on a diet where we take away milk, wheat, you know, sugar and stuff like that, and give him a lot of high quality, of, you know, supplements. And then she said, she just dropped this little note around, yeah, you know, when a child has something on his skin, it could mean that his boundaries is constantly overstepped. Um, so you might want to take a look at that. And it could also mean that your boundaries are overstepped, that he's just copying your energy. And I was like, what? Wow. What? That's, that's a big <laughs> statement to hear, isn't it? For thinking you're going in for a skin issue to then be told this is about the child's boundaries and possibly your boundaries, that could be quite confronting. Uh, she, was, she was very respectful. She was very, very respectful. And she said it, it could be, uh, that's like, if we want to look at it from a more holistic approach, that's what the body's trying to tell you. Oh, how lucky and, are you to have somebody be able to do yeah. with, you know, the body, mind, soul? Yeah, exactly. And that's why she's still a very dear friend today. So that was what she told me. And I was like, oh, something just rang a bell. Oh, that's interesting. And then I started exploring. So what is this? What is he trying to tell me? What, what is he trying to tell me about me? And I suddenly got attracted to all kinds of books around highly sensitive persons and highly sensitive children introvert, extrovert, and this just suddenly blew up in my, my reality. And I just found out, oh, my God, I'm highly sensitive. That's why I get so tired from being around people. That's why my mood is constantly swinging when I get just the tiny stress. That's why not um, that physical things are not the only things that stresses me out, but emotional things stresses me out as well. So I have more different like mental things, emotional things, spiritual things, you know, physical things. All of these things are parameters that's kind of stressing me out if I don't take responsibility. So that was very, very, very interesting. Isn't it fascinating how often our children lead us to, of course, learn yeah. more about ourselves? Yeah. You know, yeah. they, they really are here to teach us. It's, I deeply believe it's not the other way around. Yes, we're it there is. to guide them through their growing years, but the more that we can give the power to them to teach us, the wiser and heartfelt educated we're going to be. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. And, I, you know, of course, this is not for me. This was definitely not something that happened overnight. That was, that was not the case. It took years and years and years. You know, I have four children and... Um, the two oldest one has been like, will they, they have been really taking a lot of the heat, right? So <laughs> okay. They've been, they've been a massive <laughs> curve for me, very steep. Looking back, you know, I, I think, could, could, I, could I have lived without the knowledge? Yes. Would I have been happy? No. Yeah. And, and I think that's very interesting for me anyway to know there's a lot of people who live without this knowledge, but they're not happy. And it was the same case for me. And the moment I got to, like, take a peek of what is inside of ourselves, 
and take a peek of the potential that lays as when you let go of how you are, how you think you're supposed to be and just being yourself and really appreciating and embracing all the qualities in being highly sensitive, having children around you that are, that are highly sensitive, it is so amazing. For me, that's like a before and after. Just gives so much quality to life and a much deeper connection. I really feel a much deeper connection. And the whole letting go of also what are my children supposed to be and just letting them unfold who they are, it's something that is so profound. And as you said, uh, we shift roles, right? For me, having to teach my children what they are supposed to be, I just, I'm able to step back and just open my heart to see what are we co-creating here. Mm. Um, and that is definitely something that has come from the whole process of finding out, oh my God, I'm highly sensitive. How do I manage this? In my experience, you manage it by really, really turning up the volume of your of your heart, embracing yourself, respecting yourself, accepting yourself, and being much more gentle with yourself. That was something that was huge for me because like you, I came across this research by researching sensitive child uh, when my oldest child was around, I think she was around three when I thought, she's just so sensitive. How can I, how can I help her? I knew that I was sensitive, but I didn't know that I was highly sensitive at that point. And I didn't know there was a trait known as high sensitivity. So like you, I went researching and came across Dr. Aaron's research. And then I, I ordered her book and the first paragraph of it, I, I was trying to read with my daughter in mind, but instantly it was coming back to me, me, me. Yeah. And I pursued for a couple of chapters through the book, trying to focus on Tara and it just wasn't allowing me. It, it was so strong yeah. that I had to help myself first. And I know a yeah. lot of parents that are listening to this podcast have the same issue. They too have been led to this through their children and through a desire to want to parent to the best of their ability. And yeah. they then realize, hang on, it's me. It, we, I don't feel that we can both, we can't emphasize enough, can we, how important it is to help yourself first before you're in a position to be able to assist your children. It's crucial. It's the secret to success. It's the secret to succeeding as a parent, I, I, I honestly want to say because you can never, ever, ever, ever give your children anything you do not have yourself. It just can't be done. You can have intentions and you can really want something for them, but you cannot give it to them unless you walk the walk yourself. Yes, they can have it later in life, but they have to find the path themselves. I had no choice when I started reading that book. I was actually at a point, my youngest child was just a a young baby and absolutely Mm. bless her. She was a bit of a challenging baby. Not surprisingly, she's a second board child, so she's playing out my emotional story. And I wasn't coping then. I wanted to be, I had great desire to be, but emotionally I wasn't. And I look back now and realize the universe was giving me my gifts. But as often happens, I was being given my gifts with a bit of a brick. (laughs) And so this book delivered, I had to start the work at a deeper level on me. Mm. And Mm. I feel that up to that point, I'd been gathering a lot of wisdom. I'd been so-called doing a lot of self-development but not to the level that I realized self-development could be done. So I'd been reading the books, watching the videos, going to talks, but I wasn't really (laughs) digging as deep as I could. And this book kind of gave me permission to, and I think that's what we're both kind of saying is wanting to give people permission to stop and really focus on yourself take that time you're not being selfish you're not taking away from anybody else you are building yourself so you're able to give to the others to the level that you desire to and I think it's so crucial that we don't skim over that point I get emails all the time from beautiful people in fact I had one from a gorgeous lady only a couple of days ago who was saying I'm not coping I know I'm highly sensitive both of my children are but my children are not coping and I don't know how to help them 
you know, unfortunately or fortunately, is help yourself and they will mirror. They will absolutely yeah. mirror it. I also just want to emphasize how, uh, how fast it actually goes. The, the moment you actually, you know, start working on yourself, just because I did the exact same thing as you, I was like, oh, my God, I researched everything uh, with Luca. <laughs> we had, like, Luke, Luca has his oldest sister is one and a half year younger than him, so we had, like, two children, and she was also playing my emotional story, triggering me so hard. Oh, yes. And, and that went on for years before I actually found out what was going on. I had to dive deeper. So that's the exact same thing as you. And I, and I just found out it's not enough to read the books. It's not enough to watch the videos. You have to walk the walk yourself. I had to hire a coach to do that because I just didn't know how to do it. I was confused. I didn't know how to actually implement or heal my own traumas, you know. I had to do exactly the same. I hired a coach as well. I had a beautiful coach that really helped me. And then I changed coaches as I sort of learned what I thought yeah. I could from yeah. that lady, and she was amazing. And then I've always had a coach pretty much most of my adult life. In the early days, yeah. it might have been called a mentor, more of a business mentor or a career mentor. But once I realized that everything is vibration and everything is about me, I quickly switched to self-development, so coaching of self and healing. And I think that's so wonderful that you bring that up because sometimes people feel like they are a failure if they have to have a personal yeah. coach. And particularly yeah. perhaps people who have grown up in a family that hasn't had a great deal of sensitivity displayed and in a mm. culture where you are to be go-getters and get out there and kick your goals and achieve and achieve. Yeah. It can be perceived as what's wrong with you. You're weak. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. that just feeds into the paranoia of the highly sensitive person first yeah. hearing about sensitivity because, Mia, were you the same as me? First hearing about sensitivity, I also, though, still felt it was a weakness and it was yes. a flaw oh, and it was how do I get rid of this? <laughs> yes, I was crying for, I don't know, months. Even mm -hmm. as my husband, he was like, what, what is wrong with you? Why are you breaking down? I think like, I'm so sad. I don't want to be that sensitive. <laughs> yeah. Was, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm laughing because I look back and it was like, oh, I feel so sorry for myself in that moment because I remember how heartbroken I was. Yes. And then it turned out to be one of the greatest gifts of my life. I think it's okay to be heartbroken. It's okay to... Uh, you know, I had success doing things one way. I knew how to do things. That was safe for me. And suddenly, I just couldn't do that anymore. I was very <laughs> similar, Mia. It was almost like I mastered the external yeah. until it became soulless. Yes. And it left an empty hole. And that hole was filled with a deep, deep sense of loneliness and yeah. flawed you know, way big imperfections. Yeah. And then the sadness came at a soul level almost. It was a sadness yeah. of, yeah. I can actually go straight into it now and still bring tears of not wanting to be this way. Yeah. And yet I too can laugh because we've come out the other side, Mia, which is why I'm so excited that we're doing this conversation together. Two women two mums who have learnt about sensitivity on the road, you know. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't in a classroom. It was like, no, we're in the school of hard knocks here. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what excites me because I have no doubts that there are so many people listening to this almost holding their breath going, they're telling my story. And it's yeah. like, yes, because this is a common story and it's a beautiful story because through – the tears, through the loneliness, through the sadness, through the shame, the deep sense of shame of not being somebody I felt was lovable. Hang on, there's a big statement. I think a lot of HSPs will get this. Feeling that you are not lovable because you are so deeply flawed. Yeah. And that deep sadness that comes with that belief 
it's that pain that will make you do the work. It's that pain that motivates you to do it. So sit in that pain and feel it fully as deeply as you can because that is your driving force to say no more. Something has to change. What I've been doing for however many decades is now no longer cutting it. And if you're like me or an I and you've got these beautiful children that – your heart is breaking because you can see they've got the same challenges, mm-hmm. then jump on in and start the work because yeah. then you will get the gifts. And Mia, I like myself now and I am so grateful I have this trait and I mm-hmm. am so 100% deeply blessed and grateful that both of my children have this. Now, yeah. I, I think you wouldn't have said that right back at the beginning, would you, about your children? Yeah. You know, I'm grateful now because I'm, I'm through it. And I come to the other side where I have built a life around me. Um, I have built a business where I don't have to do things I don't want to do. I have built a family life where I'm, first of all, the mom I want to be. I support my kids the way I want I want to support them and I see and I hear them and we have a deeply, deeply, deeply connection. Um, you know, unconditional love that we we just spread all over each other every single day. And I have a husband and a relationship that really, really, really works, even though he is not highly sensitive. No, my husband's not highly sensitive either. Yeah. And I think that is like the foundation of my life and it has completely changed. And that's why it took so many years for me because everything had to change. Everything had to. I've been working with my relationship. I've been working with my, you know, my role as a mom. I've been working with my career because for me, and actually one of the things that was like so scary was that I suddenly felt that I wasn't successful anymore. That I wasn't worth anything because I didn't. I didn't think that these qualities would be worth anything. Yes, and that's very common. Was, you know, now we, we sit. You sit in Australia. I sit in Germany, and we connect with each other, right? Yes. And every time I have customers from all over the world, we have this deep connection, and that connection is only there because we allow the sensitivity to flow through us. And I think that that is the seed of life. That is the secret to happiness. That is the, this is the secret to feeling successful, is to be able to serve, serve other people, to be able to be there, to be able to help, to be able to solve other people's problems with them and connect while doing it. Finding the gifts in sensitivity is abundant. There are so many of them. It's it's yeah. off the scales. However, many highly sensitive people don't recognize them as gifts because it comes yeah. effortlessly and easily to them. They believe that everybody has the same thing and it's nothing special. And yeah. that is what's so exciting about the work that we do is because we are able to help people to start to see their gifts. And as they see the value that they can bring to this planet, they can start to give value to themselves and create, whether it's an income or a lifestyle or relationships that they are desiring, they can create them yeah. effortlessly um, and easily. It, it is a game changer. It absolutely is a game changer for them. Yeah. And I like to get excited about talking about all of the gifts that come with sensitivity because most people hearing this will have had decades of shame, embarrassment, resentment, anger, frustration, sadness at having this trait. So I make no apologies about going, all right, let's form the Cool Kids Club. It's the Sensitivity Cool Kids Club. (laughs) And it's not at all to ever exclude anybody else, that it is to help balance the scales. And I know that many people that I've been coaching, initially through the first few coaching sessions, they will say, you know, do you really think I'm going to learn to love this about me? Yes. And they don't believe me. They really don't. You have the same thing, Mia? Yes. Yeah. 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 And is it not the most exciting day in the world when you get that email or phone call from somebody saying, 
I am so excited I'm a HSP. I'm now doing this, 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 and this, and I, my life is rocking. It's like, woohoo. Yeah, and what I, what I often hear is um, when, I, when I ask them, how, how good are you to notarize your, your emotions and listen to your emotions and really, you know, get in tune with it, and, the, and they're like, why, why, why would I do that? That sounds silly. Well, I, I don't get anything out of it. I just want to go and do stuff, and I can do that. I can do stuff because I get overwhelmed, and then I get stressed, and then I, I, I'm, like, collapsing on the floor. And when they then suddenly start to listen into the subtle voice of their heart and to slowly integrate more pleasure, more me time, they just, you know, the balance just change. And they are like blossoming like crazy. And they're like, oh my God, there's like a before and after. And how 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 come did I it's so easy? It's so easy. Mm. How come did I never do that before? It's so naturally and easy for me. I'm like, yeah, because that's your natural talent. And so often HSPs will be on Energizer Bunny, you know, the the nonstop go, 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 busy, 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 which is actually just another drug. It's just another form of numbing out. And yeah, so their operating bandwidth, which of course is narrower, or well, the, the bandwidth that they operate within, they become overwhelmed easier and underwhelmed easier, is living on overwhelmment, which of course means that cortisols become their worst enemy and yeah. the, you know, the stress hormone. And it's so wonderful when they are given permission, you know, given permission to slow down, to stop, to yeah. do something for yourself. Take a yeah. bath, watch the movie, take the weekend off, take the week off if you can, take the month off if you can. Okay. Do whatever it is that you need to do to stop. Yeah. But not just that. What about this one? I'm sure you also uh, teach people about this one. And stop comparing yourself to others. Yes. Oh my God. So important. Because when you start comparing, you tip directly into, you know, shaming yourself and right into a drama. And I feel for sensitive people, something that is just eating them up is drama. Yes. Their feelings are so hurt so easily. And yeah, exactly. unfortunately, until they get the tools to speak their truth, they therefore won't be impeccable with their words. They're reading body language, mostly accurately, but they're not yeah. asking the right questions because they lack the ability yeah. to speak their truth. So yeah. therefore, they're making inaccurate assumptions. And those yeah. inaccurate assumptions are killing them. They're hurting and, them so much. I don't know if this is uh, if it was the same for you and if you're taking your clients as well. But for me, I had to, I seriously had to change um, my friends. I oh yes, I did absolutely. Friends. Yes, yes. And that was that was so crazy. I did not like it. I slowly had to step away from friends. They didn't do anything bad to me. They didn't harm me. Uh, some of them, some of them did, but some of them didn't. But I could just feel. Oh my god, I can feel there's something out of integrity. I can feel you say something. But your vibe is somewhere else. It's passive aggressive, say, isn't it? Very passive yeah, aggressive. Exactly. And I was like, shit, I can't be in that anymore because I can feel that, that there's something not right and this uh, out of alignment and this out of integrity uh, was and is still too difficult for me to be around. So I don't want close relationships doing that. I'm exactly the same, Mia. I had a big friendship cull, and I know that sounds really harsh, and I didn't do it harshly because I think that's I think that's difficult for any highly sensitive person to do harsh, anything harshly. Yeah. It took time. But what I started doing, my little test on this was, if I'm catching up with somebody or, or some people, and when I come home after spending a period of time with them, if I feel worse than when I left then yeah. they're not good for me. And that's yeah. what was happening. I was, or, you know, I'd wake up if we went out for dinner or to some party or something, like, you know, when I was younger and used to do a lot more of that stuff. Um, and I'd wake up in the morning and I'd be replaying conversations in my head and I was paranoid. And yeah. I thought this, I can't work this way. I can't operate this way. And so yeah. I very slowly just made the gaps between catch-ups bigger 
and bigger yeah. and bigger. And then I yeah. also played the game of, well, if I don't contact them, will they even contact me? And some didn't bother. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's yeah. a, that's another thing of, you know, am I of worth and worth or value? Clearly I'm not, so let's let that go. Now, of course it hurt. I'm not saying it didn't, but it was very yeah. empowering. And then what happened, I gained clarity of, well, what do true friends look like for me? What do I need? And I need two things. One is I always need the truth. And yeah. the second is I need compassion and kindness for how yeah. that truth is delivered. Yeah. Actually, there's a third thing, and respect for my sensitivity. Because <laughs> I've got beautiful friends in my life now, and the relationships are, are so strong with gorgeous, deep, heartfelt connection and respect and understanding of each other. If I've gone on holidays with another group of families, they want to go on an all-day tour from 6 in the morning and they're going to get back at midnight at night. I'm just actually not doing it because yeah. I can't. And they yeah. know that and they don't push me and they don't take it personally and it's respected, but it's also respecting me. And so that's what I mean by an understanding my sensitivity. Don't frown on me, don't belittle me or shame me because I can't play your game in that arena. Yeah. And that's worked sure. really well for me. What? How have you gone creating new friendships? Uh. I actually did the same thing as you. Um, I did a friendship detox. And I slowly, slowly, slowly step out of friendships that um, were just not working for me. I know just letting go, not something, not, not anything harsh, not, you know. And some of them I'm still like, well, I, I don't know, maybe we meet again later on. But right now we, we're really not a good match anymore. Well, my measurement was... Also, how, how, do I, how do I feel when I come home? It was exactly the same. Do I feel energized or do I feel pumped from energy? Do I have no energy left? And what, what is this person contributing with in my life? Is it drama? Talking bad about stuff, uh, always being uh, uh, negative and stuff. Or is it uplifting? Is it, you know, compassionate? Is it like... Does this person really see me and hear me and allow me to do the same? And if not, then we're not a good match right now or forever. I don't know. And I just found that, you know, the people who didn't do that, they just, they just didn't have, like, a place in my, you know, really close relationships anymore. What I also did, and I think this is actually a great tip, um, something that a lot of my clients are loving is you know, if you have a person in your life that you really care about and you really want to be around, but you don't share the same interests, then why don't you just meet about something that's funny, you know, something that's uplifting. So instead of, a, you know, I have some friends where we meet or, and we share, like, deep thoughts and all the language of their emotions and like, all of these quickly, craggly small things because we are on the same page highly sensitive, very much into personal development and all that good stuff. And then I have other friends just not into it. And I'm like, well, let's meet around something else. Let's go to a nice uh, restaurant. Let's go to a concert, you know, something that's a common interest and just stay there and enjoy each other company there instead of expecting other things to happen. I love that you've and said I that. I've actually got a whole podcast I did around friendship types and recognizing the value of each person in yes. your life, you know, and not one person is ever going to be all things, you know, to all people. Yes. She, and you've just led me to another one of my favorite lines I like to share with <laughs> HSPs. <laughs> <laughs> and this talking about, you know, other people. Stop yeah. expecting from others what they are incapable of of delivering because highly yeah. sensitive people we actually have a pretty high benchmark of what we expect yeah. from others and sometimes yeah. i think we might make it a little bit hard for people to live up to that yeah i agree so i love that you've talked about different friends for different reasons i've got the friends that i love to get together that are going to solve the problems of the world and the problems of my soul <laughs> 
and in a you know really exactly. deep and meaningful you know let's go right down the rabbit hole but then I've got my beautiful friends that I go right I'm sliding into your place sideways with a bottle of champagne in hand and we're going to drink this and giggle and laugh and and life's yeah. not too not too serious yeah. you know and everything in between and it's all yeah. beautiful value to life but we do need to look at what is the value and not expect from people what they're not capable of giving. And I look back on some of the friendships that I had uh, in my younger years, or particularly ones that, you know, you kind of inherit through family, through getting married. <laughs> and, you know, beautiful people, really lovely yeah. people, but they weren't my tribe. They weren't my type yeah. of people. And yeah. it just didn't work for them. I'm sure it didn't work for them either, uh, as yeah. much as it didn't for me. And interestingly, most people have revisited my life since. You know, they always come around the block yeah. again. The universe yeah. will do that to give you a chance to go, yeah. how are you going to play it this time? And it's a lovely validation of just how far we've all come when those opportunities yeah. happen because you can see that the different tools that you've now got, the resources yeah. that you've got to still have a heartfelt connection but with the boundaries yeah. that are applicable to that person. Yes. Oh, my God, yes. And it's a really empowering place to be. So even yeah. for that one reason alone, I would encourage everybody to do the work because yeah. to be able to navigate every relationship and every person that you engage with is a relationship to be able to do that with beautiful boundaries but still being heart-centered and not being fear-based or defensive or yes. aggressive yes. or projective yes. or whatever is so exciting and it's so uplifting and you really get relationships that just nurtures your soul mm. even though even though you don't understand each other yeah, as I said, from Denmark, we live here in Germany now, and our cultures are so differently. But because I learned all of this, I'm able to, you know, connect with, with people and have relationship with people I never thought it would ever be possible. That's gorgeous. So, and we are so different. But I can just, you know, with the boundaries and being authentic to myself, speaking my truth, allowing to hold this space for both of us. Exactly. Where, where we can meet and have fun and play. And then we just part again. And I don't have to carry anything for them. I don't have to be responsible for their life. I don't have to do anything. We just have to meet and have fun and go again. Beautiful. Mira, I'd love to ask about your relationship with your husband. How did you start sharing this information with him? Because I do get emails also from people that say their partner is not as, is not highly sensitive. It doesn't mean they're, of course, not a lovely, sensitive, compassionate person, but they're not highly sensitive. That gorgeous partner that loves the highly sensitive person is wanting the best for them, but they can be deeply yeah. frustrated by not being yeah. able to, particularly if it's a male that is not highly sensitive, he can become yeah. deeply frustrated at not being able to provide happiness for his wife. And he can take it on his shoulders that this is me, this is my fault. I'm not doing something I should be able to do. I've got a wife that's deeply unhappy. She's crying. She's curled up in a ball on the corner. She's sobbing. She's saying she's unhappy. She doesn't know why. She's got everything yeah. she ever wanted, but she's still not happy. How can I help her? What advice yeah. do you have for the relationship balance there? I think um, it is crazy important, again, to start with yourself. If you're a highly sensitive person, you have to start with yourself. You cannot expect your partner to know how you feel, to uh, read your mind, to uh, know what you want in life. But also your partner might, might also have to let go of, of the frustrations um, and really get some therapy himself to really look into why, why do I want to take responsibility over uh, my wife's life? And as a wife, why do I want to let him take responsibility over my life? It can be like a deep dysfunction that has to be sorted out because otherwise you will never get a really satisfying relationship. It is crazy important that you know how to take responsibility in your own life and you allow your husband to do the same. Only 100% responsibility, not 120 to you and 80 to him, 
not, you know, 150 to him and 50 to you, always 100% responsibility. And it's easier said than done, easier said than done. And you always have to navigate from you and you always have to, like, really speak your truth also to him. Communication, communication, communication. Tell him how you feel. Tell him, tell him how you, you need him to help you. I would like for you to help me to do this and this. I need this and this from you. Right now, when, when I'm, I'm really sad, I just need you to hug me. I just need you to be there for me. I just need you to listen to me. I don't need you to solve my problems. And another thing, your husband is not your therapist. Like friends, there are some things that your husband is not supposed to do for you. You know, for example, take for example our relationship. I I know there are places in in my life where my husband he, he just can't help me. Yes. He can't help. Again, it's that don't expect people to you know do what they're not yeah. capable of doing. It's it's not their role and they're not capable. Yeah. And so you're setting it's people not, up for failure. And you, and you actually give up your power to them instead of taking your power home. And exactly. You yes. Taking responsibility for your life and saying. It's okay, you know, I, I, I need my husband for uh, compassion. I need my husband for, for, you know, sexuality. I need him for, you know, uh, connecting and having someone I really love around me and for the relationship, my everyday relationship, my core foundation of life. But I don't need him to solve my problems. That's right. I think that's one of the biggest things. When people first discover they are highly sensitive, one of the first things I encourage them to do is sit down with their partner and say, you know how I've been miserable or I've been hard work or I've been, you know, upset or difficult to be around over the past however long, usually years, and to then say, well, guess what? I've just learned something amazing about myself and I want to share it with you. And then the next thing I want them to do is, or encourage them to do is to let their partner know that they're off the hook, that it's yes, not their totally. job and that you've and now committed, yeah, that the individual is now committed to a yeah. self-development campaign yes. <laughs> and yeah. that they are going to be taking responsibility for their own happiness. Yeah. And usually in a very quick amount of time, the partner yes. will see the change, the children yes. will see the change, and the house yes. just starts to get a little bit softer and gentler and calmer and sweeter That's to be not, in, which is not, really not gorgeous. A, a lot. Not a little bit. <laughs> a lot, yes, yes, yes. yes it, it does change a lot. When you're just, just starting this journey. You, um, you, it, I think it's very important to, to know that one of the signs of being overwhelmed is that your emotions are out of control. Then yes. you have overwhelmed yourself. You are overburdened somehow. If that's happened, then you need to rest. That's all you need to do. Because highly sensitive people are also very solution-oriented. Don't try to fix your problems from a low vibe. Never try to fix your problem when you are sad, frustrated, irritated, angry, depressed. No, you have one task when you are in that state and it is to be happy, at least satisfied. So if it means I need to pet my cat for three days, it's fine. But never try to solve your problem from that state of mind. Only one task, feel better and then solve your problems. Because then you can communicate much better. Mm-hmm. And you can see with clarity what is going on in your life and not try to uh, project your problems to your partner or your children or your boss. And again, you will be able to take responsibility. You will be able to bring back your own power to yourself and make the changes that you need from clarity and from empowerment and from love instead of from fear and frustrations and irritation or even depression. Because it will only give you more of that instead of, you know, hiring your vibe and solve your problems from there. My breaking point, I think, was I actually did curl up into a bowl and I did try to climb into a kitchen cupboard. And that's not my normal (laughs) behaviour. 
<laughs> but it really was. I was trying to find that little dark corner. I was going into that dark corner and shutting the door and I just, it was literally stop the world, I want to get off. I share that story though because I don't think many people actually really share just how bad they can get when their emotions are completely overwhelmed. And so mm-hmm. I, I share that just so people would be going, some people would be going, oh, wow, I thought it was just me. And so I think it's great the more that we share these funny little things that we've had in our journey as highly sensitive people to, again, just know this is all a sign of your sensitivity not being managed well. And as you get to know yourself, you get to manage yourself better. There's nothing wrong with you. It's not something that has to go on forever. It's just you're just overwhelmed. That's right. The same goes for the kids. There's a lot of kids that are like, oh, my God, they, they are so, they're reacting so much, they're so angry. They're like climbing the walls, they have so much energy. It's just because they are overwhelmed. They need help to calm down. They need help to balance the sensitivity. Luca, he, he did the opposite. He would, he would like literally hide under my skirt. Other sensitive kids react in, in another way. They, they will become hyperactive. They will become very loud, very like yelling loud all over the place, demanding attention all the time. It's a sign their nervous system is overwhelmed and they need help to calm down over a longer period of time using not just you as a parent. You, you Of course, you have to walk the walk, no doubt about that, but, the, but you really need to put them on uh, some kind of you know, sugar detox or, you know, really pouring a lot of uh, high quality omega-3 oils on the magnesium, all kind of good stuff that will go in and help them soothe and rebuild the nerve system. Even do a uh, motorical training with them, cross penance, because when your nerve system is out of balance, your brain will be out of balance. And this is on a very sensitive subject here, because that's Probably, um, research shows that's probably what is causing especially boys to have a hard time learning things when they go in school. Right. Because, and it's so sensitive, it's because they're so sensitive and their nervous system are constantly working. And do so, you so feel they- that that's also because in most of Western society, sensitivity is pushed out of boys? They want it suppressed and hidden? Oh, I think I think this is a subject that is developing a lot because I feel a lot of moms especially really know that their boys are very, very sensitive and they need to take good care of them or help them take care of themselves. But I feel, yes, especially in schools and kindergarten. I think the problem is that we see these boys and we say, oh, it's just boys. It's not just boys. It's a problem. Yes. And instead of just addressing it as, oh, it's just boys, they're a little wild and crazy and, you know, overactive and stuff. Oh, they don't want to sit on, on their butt learning. Um, so, well, it's just boys. But it's, it's not. It's their system telling a story. It's their body telling a story about them needing help to balance their system. I haven't gone down the path of magnesium or omega-3 with either of my children. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because I'd love to yeah. learn. It is amazing. Because what happens is that your, your nerve system, um, your nerve system, your hormone system, and you, basically your brain also, because all of these three things are linked very closely together, need to swim in oil to actually function. So your nerves, your nerves won't need and do what they need to do unless you have like um, an abundance of oils in your body. But it needs to be the right oils. So it needs to be omega threes. Yes. Very, very, very important. High quality, of course. And another thing is your nerve system feeds on magnesium. And when you take magnesium, you your body relaxes. So it's like um, a natural. Um, you know, you let go and you relax. And so it's a very nice thing for kids to take, for highly sensitive people to take um, when they go to bed, for example. And you can take pills, you can take, you know, put on oils, massage oils into the skin. 
you can even you can even get like granulates, you know. They taste a little like orange, like small powder thing that you can just eat directly and put on the tongue and then it like makes like squinky noises and the kids they just think it's so funny. To <laughs> That's gorgeous. I have a feeling that you and I could be talking about this for another six hours without holding breath. Yeah. And maybe we'll have to do a part two one day if you're up for it. <laughs> but no, I, I'm ready. <laughs> good. I know. <laughs> I'm going to write a list of uh, all of the emails that come through because I'm always answering them to do with HSPs. But I love the fact that we've got two HSP coaches doing this together and saying the mm-hmm. same things in different ways. And it's hopefully going to be very helpful for people. I just wondered if you had any final gorgeous pearly words of wisdom you'd like to share to those listening. I just think um, to sum it all up, to be highly sensitive is such an amazing gift, but there is a gap between if you just started this journey or actually are on it, there is a gap where it can be a lot of hard work to actually integrate a new lifestyle. First of all, it's normal. Second of all, get help so you get through it easier. And third of all, there is, every time there's an A, there's a B. Every time there's a B, there's a C. So just take one step at a time and you will never, ever, 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 ever stop developing. And even though you integrate this into your life, you know, I still need to adjust. I still need to get a feedback from my body and see, oh, uh, this was a little too much. Now we have to rest and no drama anymore. You know, okay, if I'm tired, I sleep. If I'm, you know, overwhelmed, I take care of myself, but I still get overwhelmed. Do you still get 